here. Um, so I'm James. I've been at Dropbox for about six years now. Um, I was the lead engineer on the storage team here. Where we designed and, and built our own storage system at Dropbox. Since then, I've worked on uh, file systems and metadata storage, distributed databases, that kind of work. I'm joined by two other kind of domain experts here. I'll let them introduce themselves as well, Dimitri and Victor. Uh, go for it, Dimitri. Yeah, my name is Dimitri. I'm uh, head of technical infrastructure here. What does it mean? I am running like traffic, networking, reliability, performance, all the data center stuff here at Dropbox. I've joined three years ago. I spent most of my career, my career in infrastructure, very close to networking. Spent four and a half years at LinkedIn, three and a half years at Microsoft, two years at BMW, and all the companies within networking space. So I'm here to answer all your questions. Yeah. And Victor. Hey, everybody. I'm Victor. Oh. I'm uh, one of the hardware systems engineers here at Dropbox, and I work on the server qualifications across the various tiers uh, for Dropbox. Prior to this, I was at another um, tech company doing similarly, uh, similar type of things. So feel free to ask me questions afterwards if you have specifics. Great. Thanks. In terms of domain expertise, my expertise is mostly on the software side of things and overall architecture work. Happy to answer any questions in that, that space and also throw over to these guys, uh, particularly when it comes down to reliability or, or um, networking or more the hardware side of the world. What do our, what do our internals of our chassis look like, for example? Um, great. <coughs> so. Intro to Dropbox, I think people probably know what Dropbox is here. Um, folks might uh, think of Dropbox as like that little app on their computer that just, just kind of works and it seems pretty cute and seamless and doesn't seem like a very big, big deal because it just, it just works. But behind the scenes, it's actually a very large infrastructure company. Uh, so we've got some numbers up here. Uh, you know, this, this is the scale of a company of over 500 million users, or over half a billion users of Dropbox. Uh, they have over uh, four and a half billion connections, so sharing relationships between each other. Over 300,000 Dropbox business customers, which comprise um, over 50% of the Fortune 500. Here's just a bunch of, of logos, <laughs> a bunch of customers of Dropbox, including really big companies like, say, News Corp and, uh, say, Facebook and Adidas, etc. cetera. Um, interesting stuff like the regulated industries. Dropbox has a ton of accreditations like uh, HIPAA compliance and all the SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3 compliance. So we're able to go into these regulated industries as well. Um, but I mostly want to talk about the infrastructure, the scale of the infrastructure, and hopefully that's what you guys want to hear about today. Uh, so we have over an exabyte of customer data. Um, that storage is growing over 20% year over year. Um, the systems that we have in terms of servers, we own are over 50,000, uh, but many of those are really very large, kind of one petabyte in a box systems. We have over a disk in a single chassis, which we'll, we'll actually show you in person later on today. Um, we have a pretty large network footprint as well. So that, that data has to go in and out of our servers. So over two terabits of ingress and egress. Uh, we'll go into more details specifically on our network infrastructure uh, and our POPs and how we connect directly to our users. And over 12 uh, megawatts of total power in our data center facilities, like the one you're in right now. We have many of these around the United States, and this is, this is one of the facilities. Cool, so I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of Dropbox as a company and how our infrastructure changed as a result. So Dropbox, uh, fortunately, was always what we'd call a hybrid uh, infrastructure. And we were kind of one of the early proponents of this infrastructure where we had um, storage and processing on Amazon S3. And we had our own business logic on our own servers. So I'll actually show a diagram of this. This is super, super simplified diagram of Dropbox here, obviously. There's a lot more going on. But you know, the original architecture was you had the clients here. Anything that re revolved around storing a file was on Amazon. So we used S3 to store the files. The block serving, encryption, compression, that kind of work was on EC2. Uh, block processing, like generating image previews and H.264 encoding, that kind of stuff, also running on, on EC2 or on Amazon. And then on our own servers, even from the very early days of Dropbox, uh, was the business logic. So the website, um, the synchronization protocol, the file system, how we, how we store ACLs, uh, and the back-end databases that we ran along with a ton of other uh, internal services. That changed pretty dramatically around 2014, 2015, when we decided to move the, the vast majority of our storage infrastructure into our own facilities. Uh, so we had this very large increase in the footprint of our, of our data centers, uh, expanding to three regions. So we have multiple facilities like this within this region here, but we have other regions around the United States as well. Uh, 
And the transition really was, was this. Well, we moved that into a storage system called Magic Pocket. Silly name for a storage system, but that's the, that's the system that stores block content in Dropbox. Uh, and and the, the block serving and the block processing are all in-house now. But we do leverage third parties for other services. And I'll go into that in more detail later on. That's, that's not something that uh, we, we regret. That's not something that we embrace. And that's a very intentional decision to leverage third parties when it makes sense. Um, so James, you said yes. that um, within a region like let's call it the West region, you've got yes. multiple of these data centers that, that hold uh, That's right. storage, customer storage, as well as logic That's processing and stuff like that. That's right. So we have three distinct regions in the United States. Um, within each region, there's multiple facilities. And within that facility, we have multiple clusters. So today, we'll take you to a cluster in this building, which is a facility in the West Coast region. Um, we can go into more detail later on um, about storage itself. Um, storage, uh, all block data is replicated in at least two regions. It's very widely replicated within a region. So most of the redundancy happens within a region uh, using kind of pretty efficient uh, replication strategies. We also have um, replication across regions, so we can lose you know, an entire uh, region and, and not lose that block content. Um, later on, um, which I'll go into more details, once we had that storage footprint, that pretty large infrastructure footprint, enabled us to uh, expand uh, our infrastructure more dramatically uh, into international expansion, network optimizations, which we'll go into a little bit later on. Uh, cool. So Dropbox has been perceived, I think, sometimes as kind of the poster boy for kind of anti-cloud. Like, uh, the, you know, everyone's going in this direction of they're outsourcing the infrastructure to the cloud, and we're going the other direction. So therefore, clearly, we're, we're the antithesis of that movement. That's not how we view this at all. Uh, we view this as something that's in line with our strategic interests, but probably not for many other people. Right? And I think there's three key questions that have to be asked when you evaluate why, why would one build something in-house. I'm going to go through this in more detail here, so I'll just do them now. Um, do we have the scale at which that investment, that, that the uh, investment is cost effective. Right? Most companies just do not have the scale. Um, one of the oldest uh, cloud SaaS companies, um, hundreds of millions of users, we are at the scale where the, you know, the economies of scale make sense. You know, we actually, both in terms of you know, purchasing, obviously, but also in terms of building teams to, to do this, this work. Um, does that scale allow, allow us to innovate? Like, do we have a competitive advantage? Can we do better than somebody else? Right? In particular, um, like I said, we have a very large storage use case, but we have a very good understanding of our access patterns. We have a very good understanding of, of our product and our product direction. We know how users use that content. We can, we can leverage that to actually um, to build more efficient systems. And the third really is, you know, do our users care? Right? Is the user going to benefit from this at all? Uh, number one, we don't want to screw it up, right? It's very important that the users aren't negatively impacted by migration like this. But also, what do they benefit from, from this here? And in this, in this scenario, we've, we've seen you know, greater speed, um, better reliability, um, and, and continued investments in security. Oh. Um, OK, enterprise scale, web scale, these are some big buzzwords, right? Um, how do we contrast these? Uh, we think of you know, on-premises storage as, as being fairly manually configured. Um, you know, downtime for upgrades. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of logos of companies like, like us who, who build very large kind of what we call web scale systems where there's a big focus on reliability. We'll show everyone this later on when we go to the data center and you know, actually pull power from, from racks and, and show that Dropbox keeps, keeps running. Uh, pretty flexible infrastructure, at least for the, from the perspective of, of the customer. Um, and really, because we own that end-to-end -end stack, we can, we can bring a lot of optimization there. We'll get into more technical details later on. Um, OK, so uh, th this scale you know, doesn't matter. What's, what's, the, what's, what's the point? What do we get out of this? Um, we can build bigger teams and more focused teams that work on this stuff. right? So we can have a very dedicated hardware team, very dedicated networking teams um, that, that uh, smaller companies wouldn't be able to do. And ultimately, the whole point is to bring value to the users in terms of performance, reliability, security. Um, so, so far, so good. Right? Let's jump into slightly more technical content. Uh, we'll talk about Magic Pocket. The storage system now, it's a storage system. It's big and it's complicated. And I, I can't go through all the details today of how it works. But I can answer any questions about it. 
there's a blog post here. You can you can go in and look up more details. Um, so it's over an exabyte. I said it's growing at over 10 petabytes per month. Um, pretty heavily custom stack, all the way from the web serving from the API layer, all the way down to the disk scheduler, and and the hardware architecture. So the Right now, there isn't even a file system, off-the-shelf file system, on these disks anymore. We're actually doing disk scheduling ourselves. Um, so it's, it's a very deeply integrated custom stack. Uh, that took a while to get there, right? Because you can't start on day one with something like that. Um, so I like to think of this as the, this, kind of, uh, this kind of continuum of, 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 of building, validating, uh, optimizing it, scaling and optimizing it. So you know, you've got to build it first and then, and then have some very extensive validation before you can even begin to really, really tune these systems. Um, we have a diagram here, most of it's a placeholder. I don't expect people to, to understand this diagram, but I'm happy to point things out later on if it comes up in questions. Uh, so the first, we just prototyped. Right? And this literally was in the early days, just a prototype in Python. Right? So pretty, pretty small scale, let's mess around with what architecture, software architecture, will work for Dropbox in our scale? So moving pretty quickly, experimenting with different architectures, um, obviously taking inspiration from you know, the storage literature, um, and grew that to around about um, eventually a 30 petabyte system, which for us was a was a toy system, but um, that's actually pretty big uh, by by normal standards. Um, and that gave us the confidence that we had an architecture that actually made sense and actually worked for us. Um, then there was a, a heavy investment in rewriting the system from scratch uh, in Go, and later on there's some components in Rust to actually have like a real industrial grade storage system. Um, one of the more interesting phases of the product for me was this production validation phase because what was really important to us was that we were able to pull off this migration from S3 uh, to our own uh, storage without our users noticing. Uh, without any risk to the business, obviously, and without any impact to our customers. Uh, as engineers, uh, we clearly weren't going to get a green light in this project. We couldn't demonstrate with very, very high confidence to the organization that this was going to work. Um, so uh, we had this production validation phase where we ran the system for about six months in what we called a dark launch mode. So we had a mirror of some of our content uh, on Magic Pocket, and there was a backup stored on S3. And that was getting served directly to our users from Magic Pocket. So if Magic Pocket went down, there'd be an outage. <coughs> Dropbox would go down, but we wouldn't lose the data. Right? And we could scramble and get it back up again. Right? So we had to run in this mode for uninterrupted with zero issues uh, for six months. Uh, and only after we'd kind of signed off and we'd, we'd demonstrated competency were we confident to actually delete that first byte. And it was pretty interesting because we kind of had, we, it sounds a bit cheesy, but we literally had like a contract we wrote with like Drew and Arash, uh, the, the co-founder. This is, we didn't want to be subject to this kind of um, sliding scale, you know, where like we just kind of changed the goalposts as we went. So before we started this, we wrote, this is what we want to guarantee uh, for the duration of this test. You know, X number of availability, a 0% data loss, obviously. Um, you know, none of these issues. And these are the, these are the, these are the processes we're going to follow. Um, this, uh, we, actually, we actually failed this once, interestingly. Right? So uh, we had in the office above my team, I set up a big dashboard with a big, a big counter, counting how many days uh, you know, that we'd been running this thing for. And there was this concept of resetting the clock. You know, there was the launch clock. And if anything bad ever happened, we would have to reset the clock. Um, and I forget how long it was. I think it was approximately 40 days into this time period. Um, we had an incident where there was a bug. A, a pretty benign bug actually made it through to our staging cluster. We have a pretty involved launch process. So you, know, you run tests locally in dev, and you run this overnight integration tests. Then you run it on a staging cluster, which keeps a mirror of production data. After that, it gets pushed. Uh, for, it runs there for a week with the verification coverage. After that, it goes to our, our first data center, this one right here, actually, and runs here for a week. And after that, we sign off to push it to the remaining data centers. And a bug had gotten through to the staging cluster. There was no data loss. It was caught by verification systems. Uh, so we hadn't technically violated the contract, but we just didn't feel good about it. The team, there's a sense of pride. 
um, that we didn't want to launch a system if we didn't feel like we'd actually satisfied the spirit of the rule and not the letter of the law. Um, and so we reset the clock. Costs the company a lot of money, obviously. It's not cheap to store tens or hundreds of petabytes on both S3 and your infrastructure at the same time. But that was the, that was the absolute non-negotiable. We have to do this uh, safely. Uh, deleted the first byte of data uh, from S3 on February 2015. It's a pretty exciting day. And then back to work the next day. Um, and then uh, a, a pretty intense period of scale out. So we have this project called Base Jump. And Base Jump, the metaphor is you're kind of jumping off a cliff and you have not much time to pull the parachute. We had um, strategic company reasons we wanted to move the vast, vast majority of our data off in a six month period. And that meant bringing at, in at times over six petabytes a day into our data centers. We had a, a very uh, high bandwidth peering connections with Amazon to do so. We're bringing up some days 30 to 40 racks in the data center. Victor was probably down here seeing this stuff go on. Yeah, it was, it was an intense time. <laughs> Many, like, like the provisioning process, getting racks turned up for the capacity to handle that. I mean, we spent long hours here during that time. Yeah, and, and, that. and logistical issues that, I mean, I'm the, I'm the software guy in, like, in the air condition office. I'm not the data center guy, right? I'm the out of touch software guy. So getting an insight into like real world issues like, hey, our loading dock is full because we just can't unrack that many servers per day. Um, these are really interesting real world challenges we run into. They uh, take you very far from the theoretical world of diagrams like this. Um, anyway, that was a successful project. Uh, came in you know, under, under schedule and, and under budget. Um, and since then, we've been running um, our Custom infrastructure were that were that issue for when was when was that date? 2015. So three. So you, br three years so you brought both all three regions up at the same time. So you had a replicate during this whole. We had all three regions simultaneously. Yeah. So um, there was a, obviously there was a staging. The development was yeah. staging. Yeah. But before we ever deleted the first byte of data from yeah. S3, uh, everything had to be in at least two regions, um, and uh, and. We can choose internally where we want to place those regions, whether we, we want to put the, the user's data. This is kind of a policy that we decide where those, mm -hmm. that data goes. Um, but it was a moving users, migrating users off S3, approximately on a kind of user by user basis. So we'd bring the whole user across, uh, verify their contents were there, um, and then delete it from, from Amazon. Did you have a lot of, did you have any employees that were either from, you know, like the Amazon world to help you design this and, and do this? Or did you guys figure it out on the fly? Um, you know, we have, we utilize a lot of experience on the uh, non-software side of the world. So, you know, folks who have built data centers before and, and, and put out networks and uh, run supply chain teams and, and all the big name companies. Mm -hmm. That's, we have a very, very experienced team. A lot of the software architecture was, um, based on, on, on first principles and also on just um, established literature around how to design a storage system. Where it is right now, it's really very custom for our workload. And so it's not something we could just replicate someone else's solution. Yeah. Um. So the expansion into the EU, how yeah. that? I've got a slide no. at the end. OK. Wait but that's on S3. It's on S3. OK. Yeah. And that's that's in Germany, isn't it? Say that again, sorry? In Germany, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I don't even, well, yeah, it is. <laughs> I don't know if that's ever said that publicly, but yeah, it's, it's European storage, and we use, you can guess, if it's on S3 in, in Europe, you can guess where that's going to be. Um, but yeah, that, that was, I'll get to this later on about like this hybrid architecture, but if we want to bring up European storage and we want to do it quickly, and we don't want to have to mobilize a team and, and build our data centers out there, yeah. it makes a lot of sense for us strategically to leverage Amazon. So we still have a very active, very, very constructive, positive relationship with Amazon. We use them for a lot of our services. Yep. Um, there's a lot of things you could talk about storage system internals. Right? I just picked four things here, kind of prime a discussion. People can jump in and ask questions as well if you want. Um, the first thing is it's an immutable block store. Right? So this is not a database. Right? This, is a, this is basically a key value store. You take a, a block of user content, it gets encrypted, it gets compressed, and then it gets encrypted. Um, and then it gets given to Magic Pocket, already packaged up and encrypted as an opaque blob. And we store it with a key, and it never changes. It sits there forever until we delete it later on via an offline process that's very, very conservative to make sure we're not deleting data erroneously. 
Um, so that makes things a lot easier for us. It's much easier for us to run verification across regions to make sure they have the right data um, without having to deal with, with, cha with change dynamically. There's a, a secondary system called file system or file journal which sits on top of this, which handles all the mutability. Um, hot versus cold storage, you're probably familiar with these concepts. Hot data means data that's accessed very frequently. Cold data meaning data that just doesn't, just sits there, doesn't get touched very often. If you think about Dropbox's workload, it's not um, very amenable to cold storage like you might think of it in the Amazon Glacier model. And so if you have the example I use, if you have your tax documents from 997 in your Dropbox account, probably you don't want to look at them. But if you do, you want to see them right now. There's not this model where we can say, cool, we'll give you your file in, in uh, three minutes or in a day, right? So all our data has to be accessible with very low latency. But internally, we can exploit access rates to trade off these ratios of storage cost and network cost. So, so it's getting a, a, maybe a little bit uh, technical, but you might think about the erasure codes you use to encode your data for replication. Um, there's models that if you uh, lose a block, you have to fetch a lot of data from across the network. Um, so, and, and there's models where you, know, you can keep running. You always have a hot copy there. And you can keep running with, 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 um, with, with no downtime for that block. And, and so the trade-off we make is, is some data is, is hot and it's, it's stored uh, with a greater level of redundancy. It's able to be accessed more readily. And the other data, uh, if there is a disk failure, it might require a more expensive network operation to reconstruct. Because the access rates are lower, the network cost is lower. And so we, we make these trade-offs internally based on, on the, uh, the hotness of the data. But everything in Dropbox is hot by v in the, in the uh, terminology of that you know, it has to be accessible within milliseconds. Um, but um, Magic Pocket itself is, is, is fairly cold insofar as the IOPS per disk, um, the actual read-write rate on a disk is pretty low, around five IOPS hmm. per disk. Um, and um, a lot of the traffic internally is verification traffic. You know, us internally verifying the systems. Uh, and it's designed for very high storage efficiency. Does the immutability yep. exist in the S3 storage world as well? Uh, well, that's the question about their, in so their, their API is mutable. Yeah. So the S3 provides a mutable API. Uh, we never utilize that. Um, I'm actually not an expert on the internals of, of, of S3, but most storage systems are immutable at the lower levels of the stack. You know, they have you know, uh, ref counting on blocks, and they have like, some kind of index which stores the latest version. Uh, latest version. Uh, but especially if you want to keep historical versions, uh, there will be like, a copy on write style system or some kind of um, tablet compaction. Most systems have mutability down at some level. A question on that, since with the immutability, going to in, in GDPR and write to be forgotten, you know, when someone wants to delete all their data and stuff's immutable, even, even let's say I want to get rid of my 1997 tax records and yeah. make it sure if it's immutable, I mean, you guys have such a huge amount of data. Uh, I'd imagine the way I did some reading on the Magic Pocket, Steve, yep. Stephen posted something great. Uh, do you guys actually delete that data right away? We do, not? we do. So, so there, well, not right away. Well, there, there's a life cycle. Right? And <clears> there's, there's, it gets a bit complicated because there's a few different types of deletes in Dropbox. There's something called a permanent deletion where a user actually requests that to be purged permanently. And there's a regular deletion. Mm. But typically, there's a delete lifecycle where we have an SLA on deletes, which I believe is, is under uh, 60 days for a deletion. Where So a normal delete, if you delete a file on Dropbox, we actually keep it around and accessible for you via the website for 30 days. Yeah. Uh, within that, then, then we will delete it from the storage system, unlink it, and keep a copy around uh, for for safety reasons, for durability reasons. Uh, and then once that's expired, we will garbage collect it and delete it. But there's actually a pretty comprehensive deletion life cycle. And the, the SLAs we guarantee to our users are that the delete will happen within this it's down. It's a process. You have to do it right away, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. And it's not also expensive. Some of the deletions, deletion like happens not because of the users. Like ransomware is always there. We keep getting a lot of like requests like, please give, give me my data back or something. Because mm -hmm. some virus I've just. Done it. just yeah. So yes, clear it all my folders. So there's redundancy at every level of of the deletion lifecycle. Users delete the data all the time accidentally, so we keep it there for them. And then there's internal redundancies to make sure that our deletion code is not incorrect. So once GDPR kicks in, your Magic Pocket architecture will only be used for non-European infrastructure. Uh, so there's certain users 
have like contracts with Dropbox to store their data in, in Europe, and we store those users' data exclusively in, in Europe. Right. So if we have an agreement with a, with a, with a <coughs> customer that their data is only in Europe, it will only be in Europe. We run uh, verification systems to, to enforce that. Of course, you know, if, if that data is sent to an American <coughs> customer, that it might end up in America by virtue of sharing activities. But we do guarantee uh, via this placement. So we get these placement algorithms, basically, where we can decide for a given namespace, which is an internal concept of uh, a unit of sharing granularity, basically. Uh, we decide what store a namespace goes to. And that store might be um, the East Coast and the West Coast. It might be the central United States and the East Coast. It might be uh, S3 uh, in Europe. It might even be S3 in uh, the United States. If you want to be ex we're experimenting with new features, uh, spilling data over to S3, et cetera. Uh, so we have the flexibility to place that data uh, on demand based on policies attached to those namespaces. Can I ask about your erasure coding yeah. systems? And what, just since you kind of have it up there, just a general overview of that? Yeah, so I'm not sure, and people in the stream, what, what level of uh, experience that people have with erasure coding, but I'll, I'll just, I'll, excuse me if I'm patronizing to start with, and then I'll get into details. So erasure coding is a technique to take some blocks, munch them together into a, so you might you say, say you might say six, nine erasure coding, you might be saying six input blocks, encode them together into nine output blocks, mm -hmm. and then you can, now you have nine, you have one, you have 50% extra storage overhead, you have nine blocks, and you can lose any three of them and still recover the data. That's erasure coding mm -hmm. in a nutshell. We don't use six plus three erasure mm -hmm. coding, we use bigger code, code words. So that's, that's the basics you know, of, of you know, say, Reed Solomon erasure coding. We use a custom erasure code. Uh, in particular, uh, we started off with basic Reed Solomon, we actually started off with straight up replication. Hmm. Uh, we had four way replication in each data center for a total of eight way replication during early development because we, you know, bef as we're adding features and increasing the maturity. Now we actually have, I don't think I can tell you the number, um, but we have pretty efficient storage right now. Um, and within a region, uh, we're using variants on Reed Solomon that look a little bit like something like local reconstruction codes um, where we're trading off the cost of, again, storage versus network. So for example, we have um, multiple facilities in this region here. If you lose one disk, we can reconstruct that from the same facility mm. to avoid a cross-facility read. Uh. Because that, you know, this network, uh, there's different step functions of network cost as you go up the stack from you know, within a facility to between facilities in a metro to across country. Uh, if you lose, say, two or three disks simultaneously of an erasure coder group, you might have to do a read across, across uh, facilities in a region. So that's, that's uh, the variant on the coding, yeah. Um, and so, so I guess to give you my background, yeah. so I'm a mathematician. Um, so how much are you willing to drill down into that custom erasure coding? Um, up, offline, we can, we can talk, we can geek out. So Perfect. basically, <laughs> at a very high level, we have a vendor matrix that we use to do the encoding, and we uh, add an extra row to the bottom of that matrix, which um, increases the redundancy, so it's not an optimal code anymore, but we use that um, to generate additional parities uh, that we then distribute so we can do local reconstructions for those additional parities. And, um, we can go into, I won't go into too much detail because probably some people in the stream will be lost, but I'm very happy to go, to go into detail on that. Perfect, yep. thank you. Um, any other questions? What else do I have here? Verification was the other thing I wanted to talk about. No one's excited about this to the degree I am. This is the most exciting part of the system to me is because um, you build this system and you're like, wow, I built this big storage system. That was hard. But then you've got to build the verification systems that go along with it. And the stat I've been saying I think it's correct, but maybe I'm wrong. I think there's more code in verification systems around the storage system than the storage system itself. At the very least, we spent more time building verification systems than we spent building the storage system. So this is very deep stack of verification systems. End-to-end -end checks, for example, 1% um, of all writes to the storage system are sampled, and we read them back end-to-end -end after one minute, uh, one hour, one day, one week, one month to make sure that that works end-to-end. -end. We also have like slower checks that run over our storage indices internally to make sure all the data is where it needs to be. And we have on-disk checks that are continually iterating over the content on disk and making sure it matches checksums. I'm sure some folks here will be familiar that even though a disk has smart checks on it, et cetera, 
they lie, these disks sometimes, and you F-sync and they haven't actually F-synced or they say they're fine and the data's not there. And um, one thing I can also uh, share later on is like just the Markov model we use to model durability. So you want to say how much durability do we have, how many nines do we have, and so you plug these numbers like mean time to failure, mean time to recovery into a big formula and it gives you a number of 20 something nines. You know? um, this is obviously theoretical and a little bit detached from reality. Um, those inputs, mean time to recovery, if we say mean time to recovery is 24 or 48 hours because our system automatically re-replicates that data, great. If we have a, a bad block on disk and we don't notice for a month, right, we've blown out our mean time to recovery by orders of magnitude. Right? And so our guarantees are completely invalid now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really important to have that verification coverage on disk. Otherwise, your window of vulnerability might be completely wrong. You might have completely misestimated that. Uh, so that's something we rely on very <coughs> heavily for correctness. Uh, th this is verification stack. Um, it's pretty interesting because there's like, uh, say, six or seven major systems that do this. Uh, the one on the disks fails all the time. Like it's finding disk errors every single day and it's automatically fixing them, taking the disk out of service, filing a ticket for data center, uh, re-replicating, et cetera. Um, the stack above the disk checks never finds issues, like, because the system's correct. You know, maybe if there's a big outage, there'll be a, a spike, and then it'll come back down to zero. Um, what's interesting is it's very easy to confuse a system that's never reporting errors for a system that's not even running, right? Uh, and in early development, we'd like think everything was working, and that system had just stopped because the graph is just a zero line. Hmm. So it's really important for us to actually go and trigger failures to make sure these systems are actually working. And so we literally do stuff. Uh, we do this on our staging clusters. We don't mess with, obviously, user data in the main production clusters. But we will go in and, and corrupt some data. And we have this uh, you know, test we did where one of our engineers went and kind of secretly, or I, I knew, but secretly to the team, went in and corrupted all these blocks, you know, transposed bits and truncated blocks, et cetera. And then we waited to make sure that the rest of the team came back and said, hey, here's, the, here's all these blocks that sh came up corrupt. By the way, they've all been fixed. Um, and that, that, that happens with it all the time. We, we do that regularly. And um, we ensure that, one, the verification systems are working, and also that, um, that we're able to recover from these issues without incident. You said there were seven levels of verification? It's a, it's, a blog, it's a blog post where I go through um, Every level of the I'll go through like a subset of them. So I think yeah. that blog post maybe has four or five in them. Yeah. And it's about six or seven. I could go through in my head right now. About six or seven, yeah. yeah. So, but the disk one is finding disk errors all the, time, all the and, time and automatically repairing them, but the one above the disk level is never running? Well, it's running. It's, it's never running. It's never but it's never it. actually finding an error. No, no, yeah. Because yeah. that, the one above is going through the storage index, which says that data belongs on this disk and checking if it's, if it's there. Um, and it, it always will be. All, all the disk is down, right? And that's a, that's a separate concern, right? You, so if the disk is up and it, the data's not there, that's, that, that's, that's a problem. You guys use the Chaos Monkey stuff that Netflix do? Or? Uh, we don't use the net, is it Netflix. Or, yeah. We don't use the Chaos Monkey system, yeah. but we have this Chaos Days. We basically do this our own way, and yeah. we have Chaos Days regularly where we just go and shut down multiple racks at a time. Uh, what we'll do today in the data center is a like spontaneous chaos event. We gave people a heads up. We said, by the way, we're going to kill a rack at around 4 p.m. Don't worry about it. Um, Dropbox will keep running, but we don't want anyone it's investigating it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we do go and, and mess these things up all the time, intentionally. Uh, what's next on this slide? Oh, cool, the hardware. Um, this is a storage box. Uh, this is uh, an older generation from around about two-ish years ago, I believe. Something like um, that. And this is, I don't know how many, this is probably one of the 60-ish, 60, 60, 70-disc machines. I think it's around 90. You could probably count them. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, this is a 4U uh, rack mount sled, um, which is a big bucket of discs, basically, with, with compute and, uh, and RAM and network at the back. Um, since then, we've moved to a second and a third generation. This might have been our probably third. So we've been two more generations since then uh, in terms of hardware technology. Um, actually, I'll pull Victor up. Do you want to come, Victor, and you can answer some questions about this? Uh, sure. Uh, right. I know you don't want to get on camera, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. Um, so one thing for me that was very interesting is when we started, hardware was a black box. Like you know, as a software person, you just have a, we had a file system that we'd f-sync onto, and it would just store the data. And at a certain point, that wasn't enough. Right? We were spending too much money on RAM and CPU, and um, and storage overhead for the file system, et cetera, and we had to go down the stack, 
uh, we had to have these two teams kind of meet in the middle. Um, and that allows us to optimize very heavily and, and bring down the amount of RAM we use, et cetera. Um, this is a super high level architecture of us. Do you want to talk about maybe the evolution of, of this architecture? Sure. I, I think as James was sort of saying early on, like we, we had a sort of general set of requirements we were trying to target. And so you saw the server, um, the diagram that we had a bunch of disks. Um, you know, all the disks are piped through an expander, and we actually had two compute nodes, right? Um, the expander sort of split uh, all the disks between those two systems. And as we sort of, um, and there's a, a, a caching layer there that, that helps us um, with the fast F syncs, right? Um, this was a pretty costly system, though, since we had essentially two, comp two full compute nodes uh, per box. Um, as the software system grew and as we better understood some of these requirements and what their sort of needs were, we were able to sort of alleviate um, some of the complexities by, by, by actually pulling out one of the compute nodes. That would actually increase sort of the failure domain, but we got more comfortable with that as we understood the software and as the durability model sort of increased there. Um, there's been some architecture changes in terms of how we deal with like, the different caching layers. Early on, we were using a rate controller. Um, now we're actually um, moved to an HBA with an SSD as, as caching, um, which opens up more options for us in terms of like exploring um, just more options there, right? And we're not really relying on any single sort of a vendor in that sense. Um, I'm happy to go into more details later on when we actually take a look at um, the chassis out there and we can go through some of the different designs and whatnot if you guys have um, more questions. I mean, some of the transitions were, when we first built this out, we had RAID cards in these boxes, like Victor was saying, yeah. um, because we wanted fast F-Syncs. Uh, we wanted an F-Sync. Uh, we, we had various types of disks in production. Some were, some were faster and some were slower. Um, but we had NVRAM on these RAID cards that gave us fast F-Sync. Um, it allowed us to have a high-performance storage system. Um, those RAID cards were expensive, and they're also pretty cumbersome operationally. They are. Like we have, we want to dual source everything. We had all the different vendors, and they all had different ways to configure these cards. We weren't actually running RAID on them. We were just right. using them as a, as a, like a write-through cache. We were just using them as a, as, as a F-Sync accelerator, basically. Right. Right? Um, and we weren't getting much out of the caching because our workload is very random most of the time. Um, so we're like, well, how can we get away from this? How can we move more to an HBA model? Um, so we have this model now where there's actually an SSD on these machines. Uh, we stage those writes into an SSD on the live write path. And then we decide to flush them when we schedule them out to disk uh, asynchronously. Um, and then there's uh, most of the data moving around the system is not live traffic. It's kind of offline traffic, like uh, compacting data and moving it around and erasure coding it. When we first write it, it's not erasure coded. When we first write it, it's replicated. Mm -hmm. And then we wait for some time period after the data becomes colder, and then we erasure code that for efficiency. So there's a lot of flows going around the system, and but these are kind of uh, these are sequential kind of block level flows. So we can stream them out straight to the disk, and the latency is fine. So all that data just goes straight onto disk, and it's the live writes that, that hit this SSD. Um, yeah. Cool. Any questions? You guys always use the largest capacity SATA you can find. Is that the? Um, no, I mean, I, I think when we first started, there was a certain ratio we were trying to target. And I think as, as those capacities grew, that, that was one of the big challenges that we had in sort of right-sizing these boxes, right? I think at, at, at this point, with around 100 drives, we're, we're sort of pushing some of those boundaries. And I think some of the bottlenecks that sort of incur are, are the things that we, we solely address to meet certain SLAs. Um, network is one of the big ones that we recently addressed as we start seeing you know, 10, 12, 14 terabyte disks. So. Yeah. We want the cheapest, most right. reliable storage. So density is typically where we target. Uh, there's a point in time where that failure domain gets too large. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now, like I said, approximately a petabyte in this box, mm -hmm. uh, which is a large failure domain, right? Because if the, if the disk die, if the machine fails, well, probably the disks are okay. But say the machine, the machine burns down, you've lost the petabyte of data, right? That's not a reliability problem because we can replicate to avoid that. So we model that and we replicate it accordingly. But the failure domain is still large. So that means if there's a failure because, I don't know, a machine crashed or there's a bad fan or something, you've got to re-replicate a petabyte on the network. So you've got to provision a much more expensive network. Um, and also it means uh, the, kind of the cell size, like we have an internal unit called a cell, uh, it gets pretty big because you need to have a lot of placement options in the system. So just say you want to store data on 14-ish machines, separate machines, right? Uh, that means the minimum size is going to be around 20 petabytes, 
20, 30 petabytes, right? So it's getting to the point now where you, you can't, if with a, that kind of granularity, this is only a, a big storage system. You, you, we, we couldn't even do uh, initial European deployment unless we had a large amount of data to justify that. And partially that's because the family domain just needs a very large system to be able to, uh, to amortize that, the cost. And you don't want to, you don't want to, we have something called a utilization factor we track, which is how full are our disks. Uh, and that number is probably a lot closer to 100% than you would guess, right? Because uh, we want to use all our capacity. Others are wasting money, right? And that means when a disk fails, you need an, a machine fails, you need enough space on the other disks to take that data. Uh, so these are all these uh, factors you tweak. Right now, we're in a sweet spot for our current, the current generation of hard drives. Um, but you can imagine if this, get, this will get bigger. Uh, if you move to, say, 20T and beyond, uh, the architecture may change. We might move to a, a, a unit, a, a smaller uh, failure domain. So are you guys using conventional magnetic recording disk or SMR or, or you know, a shingled magnetic recording? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we, <laughs> what's that official lineup? We're, we're yeah. working on both of these. <laughs> yeah, we are. The majority of our storage is, 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 is PML. Yeah. Is it consumer, like SATA drives? Is it enterprise drives, SAS? They're enterprise. So they're enterprise, they're enterprise yes. SAS, really? They're enterprise SATA. Enterprise SATA, yes. All right. Do you guys maintain a specific ratio of how much density in a box? to, or no, node, excuse me, to uh, network payment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, these are all the challenges with scale, right? Because, yeah. and especially when we went from, say, um, 100 petabytes to internally multiple exabytes when you look at replication, et cetera, uh, in about uh, six months. Uh, and there was a lot of growing pains. A lot, you know, a lot of things have to scale. Um, stuff like, uh, we have a 40, t 40 uh, gigabit NIC on, on these machines currently. Mm -hmm. um, that was necessitated when we went to the next generation, the, the next generation of hardware. It was 10 gig before. Um, you deploy 40 gig NICs and all of a sudden you can't push 40 gigs through the NIC because of the, the TCP stack and the kernel. And, and all these kind of issues um, require a lot of work, right? Currently we do get pretty close to, four, to 40 gig. We get above 30 gigabits through these things. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly when we first deployed it, I think we were getting eight gigabits through a 40 gig NIC, and we had to do some actually pretty heavy investment to like to optimize our use of, of the networking stack. Um, it's uh, you, you can imagine a, it's you know it's a sizable team. There's a lot of engineers across like hardware, network, and software, and uh, even communicating these requirements can get tricky sometimes. Right? So we have rules of thumb. We have you know per disk per terabyte of storage, we want X amount of CPU and X amount of RAM and X amount of network. Um, that we can give guidance to the hardware team when we're designing a new SKU. Um, but then there's always there's the second pass where you, you can tweak that, right? And especially when we go to new generations of storage technology. We had a project called Discotech, which uh, is a disk technology project. I was kind of proud of that name. But, uh, my greatest achievement. Um, and uh, that was really about that, the next optimization. So pre-Discotech, we were using a file system on these disks. Um, the data was getting stored as one gigabyte extents on a, on a file system, on an XFS file system. Uh, we had some issues with XFS and, and use EXT4. Um, but Discotech was really like, let's get rid of the file system. Let's greatly reduce the amount of um, memory on these boxes because RAM was getting expensive. Uh, let's try to reduce uh, the CPU as best we can. Mm -hmm. But a very, very efficient storage layer. Um, and that's when we moved to this new generation of this kind of petabyte box. So in the diagram the, that shows the storage server, it shows the drives being lifted out from the top. Yes. Um, yeah. So this one is a wide photo in the wide article of the yeah. disk. Yep. So um, if a drive fails, do you leave it failed? Do you replace it? Do you move the yeah. box? I mean, the contract we had with the data center folks with building a storage system was like, there's no like SLA on how quickly a disk gets replaced. They probably have an SLA internally for what, what they, you know, for their own performance. but like. As far as the software is concerned, that disk fails, you can leave it there forever. I don't care, right? As long as we have enough capacity, as long as there's enough machines sitting around to take a look, it's okay. So everything's re-replicated automatically, and we have policies that you actually can't even, like, um, you can't decommission that, that box until all that data has been re-replicated. So the, the software stack knows, hey, uh, this, this machine's bad, for example, has to go out of service. Um, 
the software knows what blocks are on that machine. It makes sure everything's been re-replicated to other machines. Only then does a, a ticket get filed that someone can actually go and decommission that. There's like a gating process that no one's allowed to touch that thing really, you know, until it's until it's good to go. So you're going to leave it failed. Leave it failed. Yeah, because There's no I wouldn't like want to move typically, all those drives. Right, right. So so yeah. so typically in an event where you have like a single disk failure, right? I, I think the uh, the software stack will actually mark it as bad. Uh, a tick will get generated. It get, it goes out to the data center team here, where they can then hot swap the drive. Once the drive has been swapped and that ticket's been act, um, it goes back to the software team, where they can then um, cycle through their process to actually bring that drive back online as a new disk. Yeah. And that's automatic. Yeah. Uh, all the stuff that's happening in the data center is asynchronous. So there's no concept that someone has to ride along on a scooter right. and replace the disk real quickly before we lose someone's data. It's, that's all done automatically. Yeah, automatically uh, very, very rarely would you actually down an entire chassis for a single disk failure. Usually it'd have to be a more systemic issue um, with something going on with the box, whether it's like a rate controller failure or something where all the disks just went offline. That would warrant something that drastic. So how much memory does your system require nowadays on these sorts of servers? How much RAM? I forget. Um, <laughs> I the, older designs, the older designs were, I think we started around 64 upwards, I think now around 96. 96 gigs of RAM yeah. for about a petabyte of storage. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, not that's not bad at all. That's not bad at all. Yeah. yeah. 96 gigs? Yes. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. yeah. Huh. yeah. So that it took a while to get there. It took a while to get there. When you don't have a file system, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you can imagine the, the lineage of what the machines looked like along the way, the first machines were just what we call web class machines. They were literally like four disks in a, in a web server, that's what we experimented with. And then we, uh, first generation, were kind of more off the shelf hardware, around about 30 ish disks mm -hmm. in a chassis with a lot more RAM and a, a, a lot more CPU because the system was inefficient. And we didn't even really know how it would behave at scale. Mm -hmm. And then we went to a next generation, which was uh, 60 to 70 disks with, with less, less RAM and less CPU but like from a one gig NIC to a 10 gig NIC, and now we have the one petabyte-ish, around about 100 disks mm -hmm. with the less than 100 uh, gigs of RAM and, yeah. and the 40 gig NIC. How heavy is one of those servers? <laughs> so it's actually interesting, like we actually, um, since we're in this co-location here, when they design the space, there's a 3,000 pound limit, so yeah. we're actually, we actually can't use all the space in the rack. Can I ask that question? We, we're usually around six to eight chassis per rack, and that's sort of the weight limit um, for any one of these racks that we roll into the suite. It's 24U, that's it. Uh, 24 to something to like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, four, it's around 4U per box, so yeah. And then there's some spacing in between, but they're, they're, they're very heavy. I think, I think upwards 20, I think in total it's around 2,700 pounds, I think, with, like give or take. And I, I just think back to all of the amusing kind of uh, growing pains during development, like, oh, hey, the the wheels on the chassis oh, yeah, the casters. compacted. The casters compacted yeah. and we couldn't push them around. <laughs> right. <laughs> because those do have, you know, the, the, these things that happen during development. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And these are, are large form factor disk drives? Yeah. Have you experimented with uh, small form factor disk drives and things like that? Uh, <clears throat> not in this sort of current design here. I, I don't think that really makes sense just, just in terms of like the cost per gig and the density that we could sort of put in this and sort of like the power envelope that we want to operate in. So Would you consider these NL SAS, but they're SATA, right? SATA, SATA drives. Yeah. yeah. These guys and generate quite a bit of heat. Do they have to do anything special for you on the heat in the data center? Um, no, surprisingly not. They're actually not too bad. And like that, that, was one of the, that was one of the concerns that we had as we moved Five up in density, drive. right? But I think some of the, the vendors that we work with, they actually had pretty it's good, still um, rotating them, right? yeah, they had some pretty good teams designing the thermals for these. It's, it's surprising. Um, cool. If anything, it's, um, usually the rotational vibration that yeah, is RB more of a stuff. challenge yeah. once we start getting into these more densely populated chassis. I mean, if, if these started cranking like you were doing a rep, like let's say you were rebuilding from right. another, so they, and all of a sudden you started cranking up, but imagine the heat wouldn't go way up. Have you, have you? Yeah, I that? mean, I, I think when we go into the data center, you'll actually see um, some of the things that we actually do to, to, to better facilitate sort of like the heat, like the thermals there. Mm. Um, yeah, but um, as, as part of the qualification process, we'll actually run full out stress, crank up all the drives, That's get cool. sort of power numbers to get an idea of what these will operate at, at the rack level, just to make sure that these, that these do operate um, within the, the norms mm. that we expect. For us, power is more of a concern than heat right now. Yeah, right? That like, was my next question. Okay, so, so what about power? Yeah, power the, 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 Not the power cost, but the, uh, the power utilization yeah, on, yeah. A, on, a, on a rack, yeah. Um, I mean, it, 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 it sort of varies, right? I think, I think anywhere you can budget anywhere about five watts per, per disc. I think depending on the workload, we see some of these spike upwards of 
1.1 to 1.5 kilowatts per chassis, depending on the workloads. These are some of our higher density boxes. Yeah, I was guessing that you were going around a kilowatt per chassis, and, there. Uh, and I was trying to think, you know, what about like power density in terms of uh, rack locations and uh, power density in the data center? Right, right. Um, some of those guys might be able to speak to that distribution, but we have, well, yeah. I, I, I don't think we're constrained to how much power per given rack location, at least on the storage. We're actually not sort of, um, that's not a concern there on this particular tier, so. Yeah, when we tour the data center, we'll definitely go over uh, go over those details yeah. uh, and how we monitor it. Thanks. How, cool. how often are you adding capacity? Constantly. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Goes and the uh, goes in waves. Yeah. It's, That's, yeah. Uh, we don't want constant thrash. Uh -huh. you know, so you don't like pulling things out, and putting things in all the time. Apart from we're <coughs> growing very very rapidly, right. but um, they, they're coming in pretty constantly because you want to. Optimize the supply chain. You don't want too much hardware sitting right. there unused. So you want a pretty optimized process of hardware coming in and right. getting put into production. I think I think early on when we're talking about like the discotech project, it was a lot of racks coming in all at once just because we're we're making room for all that space. We sort of settled into a, a more general cadence um, now since we're we have a better like we have a capacity team that deals with all this. So we have a better idea of just how much. Um, what the consumption sort of looks like, what our runway is, and we have like a normal ordering cadence um, with, with regards to storage anyways in all the different sites. So, When you're bringing in a new node, are you fully populating the storage like as it comes online, or are you kind of waiting for new data to come in for it to redistribute? Yeah, um, that's another area of optimization. Do you think like what are the challenges that we, that we ran into when we were scaling? Some of them were, for example, um, you know, if you bring up a, a new machine, you can't just hammer it all of a sudden. Right. You can't, like, if the system naive, all of a sudden, here's some fresh meat, here's some new capacity, let's, let's rebalance all our storage onto that one right there. So there's, we use a lot of heur heuristics internally, and so we do a combination of, there's a lot of background processes, like, for example, compacting to get rid of deletes, mm. or erasure coding for, for data that's been sitting there for a little while, or, um, or moving data around because of failures. And so we'll bias towards the new hardware, mm -hmm. but with these ratios to make sure we don't saturate the network card. So there's a lot of uh, tuning internally to make sure like, we don't saturate NICs, top of rack switches, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then there's a, a slight bias on the, the new rights as well. Um, there's, a, there's kind of ratios all the way down the stack of like data's coming in, what, uh, what cluster does it go to? Because there's multiple cl clusters in the facility, what, what region do they go to, et cetera. And they're mostly kind of heuristics based on some experience of what we can get away with. We want to use this hardware as, as quick as we can, but just um, without saturating the NIC. And so typically the early life is the hottest that machine ever will be. Because it's, it's there, we want to fill it up to approximately as full as the rest of the system, and then it, then it just slowly, slowly approaches the average. How much of that administration can be automated? It's all automated. All, all of it? 100%. Um, there, there is some stuff like uh, policies that like someone has to put yeah. the rack there, right? And when we first started building these things out, we had policies like, for example, you can't bring all the racks in and stick them in one pod, in one, one cl cluster. You can't just put all your racks in one power distribution. Uh, I, I don't have the terminology right, but you know, under, under one, one leg of the circuit breaker because we w won't place data there, because the, the software system knows to put data on in different power uh, distribution uh, units and on um, on different uh, mi different racks, for example. So when we are bringing up a new cluster, there's a little bit of um, shuffling, like it has to get striped out a little bit. Yeah. Um, you can't just put everything in one corner. Um, but then beyond that, when new hardware comes on, the software system just kind of assimilates the storage. Yeah. Should, we, should we push on? I'm not sure how we're doing for time here. No, no. Okay. You're, good. Yeah. You're good. Doing great. Any other questions about hardware? And the next thing we're gonna go to network. You, so. gonna, are you gonna cover the actual um, so, uh, operating system and everything else that runs inside the hardware as well at some point? Or um, no, but I can answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what can I? How can I give you a satisfying answer to that after the fact? 
So that's the blog. <laughs> and there's also, I'm happy to answer anything about that stack because that's, that's the area that I work that, on. That blog I've read doesn't say anything, anything about the actual operating system running So what do you mean the operating system on? Oh, so literally the operating system yeah. on the box. Yeah. Oh, they run uh, Ubuntu right. 16. Well, Optimized? It's, uh, no, it's, just, uh, it's, it's the native. Uh, it's the vanilla Ubuntu version. Oh. Right. Yeah. So, so how we treat um, deployment so the whole system lifecycle, for example, at Dropbox, software is pretty dedicated, but our other hardware, um, you know, all this compute uh, has all different sorts of requirements. So we bring up a very, very vanilla, so the system goes through an installer, a very vanilla stack, Ubuntu, um, nothing fancy, and then we, we bootstrap it based on what is, what's required for, for that application. So there's like an conf automatic configuration process. Um, on the, on the storage side, it's a little bit more bespoke. So um, there's, a, there's a root disk, which is like running a file system, which I, I'm going to guess is XT4 these days. Yeah. Um, XT4 file system that's just got the operating system on it. I think it's probably rated, is it a RAID 0 or something? The operating system? Yeah. On, no, on the, 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 the boot disk? No, it's just a, it's a single, single boot disk these days. Single boot disk. Um, and then uh, once the storage system starts running, it will go in and... Um, Allocate the disks basically. Like it'll go and, and, and format them accordingly, automatically. Yeah. Okay. And the servers themselves are built in house or ODM built or just super micro? Or? Yeah, we work, you can go into more details. I mean, I can talk to you offline about that, but we use like the, I'm, I'm pretty sure like some, some of like the more major names that you're familiar with. But part, we, we work pretty closely with them on the specs yeah. and the design. We're not building our motherboards. And we're with not, whom, sorry? We, we work pretty closely with them. Them? Them, <laughs> right, okay. Them, <laughs> them the big, the, who you would guess, the big yeah. uh, manufacturers who might make hardware. We have multiple vendors and everything's dual sourced. Um, but um, we're not building our own, physically in house building our own hardware. Not even considering ODM approach? We are working with ODMs. So yes. Now you're going to the level of fine tuning the sort of firmwares and the disk drives, like, for example, the megascalers do to reduce tail latencies and things like that. Uh, we we have some custom firmware, right? We do have custom firmware. Um, we are going in that direction, and I think um, it's one of those things that you know, as we look at newer technologies, that's one of the things that without, that we're always on the forefront. You know, it, I'm sorry. With the number of disks you guys have, very interesting to see what sort of statistics you're seeing from a reliability perspective on these sorts of things. Do you guys publish anything? Yeah, that is not actually secret, right? And we can. I don't know, actually. I think we might. We have our own. Publish some of this stuff. You can yeah. talk offline to this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think I can't give you anything right now, but I've, it'd be interesting to share. It, right. we, we're pretty open, right? So we'd love to share what we can legally share. Yeah. Um, but we need to figure out what that is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what can I say? Um, these disks are typically uh, have been outperforming the rated mean time failure. Yeah. Um, and we do track uh, failure rates across the manufacturers. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, they, we ask, they are, disks are pretty reliable. Um, yeah, for the most part, we've been pretty good. I think we have our own in. Yeah, we, we, can, talk, we can talk offline. The, the bigger challenge to us is not necessarily the reliability in production, but the qualification, right? So, you know, you, you get hardware comes in, there's a whole hardware stack, and actually qualify that for production, there's often a lot of issues have to be uh, ironed out there, making sure that these are reliable enough to go into production. Once they're in production, we're, we've, we've had some pretty good experiences. Yeah.